You may be seated. Happy Easter. And maybe for some of you, this is the first time you've ever experienced an Easter vigil. Well, not really. This is not all of it. You missed the great fire uh, that would, start, would be started outside where the Easter candle would be lit. And normally we would also have those who have been going through the RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults, they would also be baptized, and those who have already been baptized would be confirmed and Eucharized uh, into the church, which would happen right after the homily. Instead, all we'll be doing is the renewal of our baptismal vows um, at this point, and then the regular just be regular mass. So, yes, you are experiencing the Easter vigil, but no, you're not. So this might just be whetting your appetite for next year. Uh, when we can celebrate this grand mass, this grand liturgy, amongst all the liturgies uh, the Easter Vigil is. But we now enter into this mystery, the mystery of our salvation, our redemption. And here we have, we might say, the renewal of our friendship with God, our, the bonds of marriage. And where does that all come from? Our baptism. Our baptism. That's why this evening, this night, we will renew our baptismal vows, reminding them who are we? We are the bride of Christ. We are the mystical body of Christ. We are sons and daughters of God the Father. That's our deepest identity. That's who we are. And so our marriage, hopefully for those who are married out uh, listening to us, who is your marriage spouse, your best friend? your greatest friend. And so much you want to become one with that person, one mind, one heart, one soul. God wants to do nothing less, that we might become one. And so once more, our humanity is raised up through Jesus, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we now go into this salvation history, the bond of friendship broken, how sin dissolve that bond uh, as we hear through the reading, especially uh, in the book of Genesis. And so our first reading reminds us that when God presents uh, creation, and we heard all seven days, and every day was good, and when God made us, humanity, we're not just good, we're very good. Uh, we were that bride, stainless, uh, of original justice, and through our, our sin, uh, we fell from grace. We fell from grace. But first of all, we see in the garden what it all looked like before the tires went flat, before the ship got beached. What was it like on uh, these first three chapters of Genesis when God put everything into motion as he created all of creation and his bride, us, us, his bride. And going past the curtains, we see that beauty and that mystery of that bond of marriage. But with the second reading from, next one from Genesis, we see how that friendship has a price. We have Abraham and Isaac. And Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And God who, who uh, commands and desires and wants that, uh, but again, we see how God's love, God's graciousness saves uh, Isaac. And we have uh, th that, that understanding of our vows. Our vows have a price in marriage. Uh, for better, for worse, rich, or poor. And so as we go through this, think of your own marriage. Uh, think of your own, your own love uh, when you first said the I do. And then the second, third reading from Exodus reminds us of, are we willing to fight for our marriage? Are we willing to die for our marriage? We see Moses bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery with his strong right hand, God does this. And for the Israelites to trust in God as the Red Sea is split, uh, as they go through those waters and that baptism. Uh, there's a sense of Israel being close to God, trusting God through all this. God is fighting for us. Are we fighting for God? Are we witnessing to our spouse as well? Or have we walked away? Have we abandoned uh, our spouse? 
In our fourth reading from Isaiah, Isaiah speaks about, we shall marry our builder. We shall marry our builder. Uh, we, the church, Isaiah has already prophesied, you know, foreshadowing of this coming together of God and humanity. And so the wife who has been barren, God says once more, she will bring forth life. And we are told in Genesis twice and throughout Old Testament, even in the New Testament, be fruitful and multiply. This is something that we, uh, that marriage has, that you can create another soul that never existed for eternally bliss or eternally damned. Uh, that's again, that free will of each and every one of us. Uh, we have that free will, but that creation of that new life, uh, that life that's been breathed into that child, that soul. And so as God says to Israel, you who were once barren, you're once more giving life. You're once more giving life. Life has entered back into you and your children. They're coming home. And then our second reading, uh, fourth, fifth reading from Isaiah speaks about all who are thirsty, all who are thirsty, come, come to the Lord, all who are thirsty. And reminding us, don't waste your money on that which will not give you life. A lot of us are wasting money. We're going here and there. We're looking for, looking for love in all the wrong places. Many of us are looking for love for all the wrong places. We're trying to attach ourselves. And in the process, as the Old Testament speaks about, we commit adultery. We commit adultery when we attach ourselves inordinately to objects, to things. We commit adultery, idolatry. And so we're told, don't waste your money. Here is your spouse, here is your God, freely, openly giving himself to you and to me, to us as the bride. And then we hear here from Baruch, the prophet. He says, wisdom, wisdom be attentive. The commandments have been given to us, you know, uh, of how we live out our marriage with God and God with us. And so let's play fair. Uh, let's play by the rules. Uh, let's treat each other with dignity, with honor, with mercy, with love, with thoughtfulness to our spouse. As God is to us, may we reciprocate that love, that mercy, that kindness, that devotion that God desires, God wants, God demands of us as his spouse. As obviously we demand of God as well to be faithful to us, to his promises, to his words. And finally, we hear from the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel, who speaks about God. We take God at his words, that this new start, this new life, as he says, I will sprinkle you with water. I will cleanse you. I will purify you. Again, we have the foreshadowing of baptism here, um, speaking to us as this bond that was broken, is now coming together, is being repaired, is coming back together. Uh, we even hear that from Hosea. Come back to me with all your heart. As Hosea speaks to his bride as well to come back to him, she who was acting as a prostitute, a whore. Be faithful to me. And so the bridegroom is not giving up on the bride. And so that sprinkling of the water that the prophet Ezekiel speaks about to purify his bride, the foreshadowing of his church, the foreshadowing of his church of baptism, which leads us in the book of Romans. Uh, you are no longer dead to me. You are no longer dead to me, Paul is writing to uh, the, Christ the Roman Christians. That God says, you are no longer dead to me. And as Paul goes to this whole thing, we hear death, death, Death is full of it in this uh, epistle from Paul, that through death, we enter into the waters of baptism. And like how Christ died, in the waters we die too. And we rise from these waters, a new creation, a new person, a new relationship with God. I will be your God and you will be my people. We hear that in the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, with Jacob, and now with the new Israel us. We are the new Israel. And so that baptism, that dying, and so we enter into his passion, which 
Passion, we might look at Holy Thursday, and through his death, Good Friday, and now to the resurrection, the vigil, Easter. We rise in that resurrection. And the life of the Christian uh, struggle, that marriage, that union that Paul speaks about, we now enter into it. For a dead person has abolished, was have absolved from sins. When someone dies, you know, in this world, again, game over, done. Whatever debts I might have, toodaloo, bye-bye, it's all yours. And so that's what Paul's saying too, when we die in the waters of baptism, again, those debts that we may have had, they've been paid for. Christ has done that. Christ paid a debt he did not make for a debt you and I could not pay. He paid that price for us. And so that whole baptism, that washing, and with that, reminds us as well, Paul speaks about this probably in chapters 4 and 5 of Romans, about faith and faith. Faith is the inward sign, and baptism is, is the outward sign. And what do we call that as Catholic Christians? A sacrament. We call it a sacrament. A sacrament meaning mystery. Mystery. And that mystery of the union, how the two have become one. Uh, through this sacrament, through this ritual uh, that we go through of the dying and the rising, the new creation, uh, the bride being made pure, being made whole, that mystical marriage that the book of Revelation speaks about, all the way to chapter 19, where they have the, the Lamb's Supper, the Lamb's Supper, that celebration, that victory that we will all celebrate in heaven. Again, Revelation is kind of giving this, this openness, this vision for us to see as well. And finally, we come to the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew speaks about here, my brothers, my brothers. Reunited and it feels so good. So reuniting, uh, as Jesus will call his disciples, my brothers. Here we have a very dramatic scene in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, where Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are coming that morning uh, to once more be there to mourn. And as they're coming to the tomb, we have all this drama unfolding, the earthquake, boom, wham, smam. And then we have uh, the angel coming down from heaven, rolling over the rock that, that, that block the entrance, and he sits on it triumphantly triumphing over death. And with that, he invites Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to peer in and to see that the tomb is empty. But that's not it. That's not the end of the story for them. The angel then says, go, go to the two uh, the disciples and tell them uh, that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. So they go in haste. Again, that's the mission. We gotta move. We can't be bench warmers. We can't be sitting around going, oh, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed No. We have a call. We have, a, as disciples, as a mission to tell all the world, like Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, we also are called to be sharing this with other disciples. Other disciples maybe who have walked away. Other disciples who have forgotten who they are and what, it's, what is it all about? What is life all about? It's to get yourself to heaven. Get yourself to heaven. Get yourself, get your spouse, get your son, your daughter, your friend. Reach out to the stranger as well. Tell them the good news as well. Will they believe you? Not necessarily will they believe you. Does that stop you from sharing the good news? Did it stop Mary Magdalene and the other Mary? No, it didn't because the disciples didn't believe them either as well. You know, uh, again, they weren't as considered those days the best witnesses. But as the women are leaving, who do they encounter? They encounter Jesus, and he tells them the same thing. But he tells them differently, in a sense, he adds that one line, go tell my brothers. Remember yesterday in Good Friday, everybody abandoned Jesus. Everybody disowned Jesus. Everybody walked away from Jesus. Peter denied, the other apostles walked away. And again, whoever denies Christ, the Father denies as well. And so now we hear this reunion, this coming together, 
as the, as the disciples, apostles, the church, very small at that time, a little baby, wah, 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 but that baby is growing. And so Jesus calls the disciples, my brothers, tell my brothers that they are no longer slaves. They are my friends. And that forgiveness, that mercy has been poured out upon them from the cross as Christ has forgiven them, as Christ has forgiven you and me as well. Redemption. And so blessed are the pure of heart. They will see God. One of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure of heart. They will see God. And so I was encouraging, I'm sure many others, priests, throughout our diocese around the world, we're encouraging Catholic Christians and Christians of the whole, get reconciled, get reconciled, get pure of heart. Uh, reminding us that only with a pure heart, with reconciliation, will we be able to see God and see him. And so we move from where we are in Egypt, we're going to Galilee as well. We want to see our God. We want to see the wholeness, the church, triumphant. And just a little bit now, we're going to renew our baptismal vows. And I will hope that you might do this at home as well. That as um, I am uh, saying each line, you might respond, I do. Um, and with that, uh, for those here from the Catholic community of Labre Croce, in our cluster, uh, we have uh, in the back in the narthex, we have little bottles of blessed holy water for Easter. We ask that you might come, if uh, you take the risk, to come out from your shelter uh, and to, or sometime during this Easter celebration, it's 50 weeks, it's 50 days, excuse me, um, that you might get uh, maybe a bottle or two. Take, don't touch all of them, just take one or two and uh, take it home and maybe sprinkle your family, sprinkle yourself, sprinkle your house, bless your house and your house, which is who we are. We are the temples of the Lord. May the Holy Spirit reside in us. And may this light, this pastel candle that represents for us Jesus, who is the light of the world, may his light enter into your hearts to set you and I on fire, uh, that we might be disciples, my brothers, my sisters, and go tell all the world, tell all the world that Jesus is alive. God bless you all, and Happy Easter.